better. Of course, I talk pretty loud anyway, and sometimes I might not need uh, a microphone, but I know if you are like I am now in my older, older, did you pick up on that word? My older age, I don't hear as well as I used to. And so I always like to have the audio on and up for those of us who don't hear quite as well as we used to. All right, tonight, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, uh, verses 17 through verses 20. I have printed these verses on your bugged out sheet. I printed them from the New International Version. Jesus is speaking. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, verse 19, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, before I delve into all the written stuff I've got for you, I'm going to say one more time. So, no, I don't want anybody to come back up here down the road and say, well, that preacher just, he just plagiarized so-and-so. Well, yeah, I'm plagiarizing William Barclay. I tell you that every time we meet. I brought the commentary and showed it to you. I'm plagiarizing the, new internet, the international commentary. I brought that and showed it to you. So, yeah, I am. I'm doing that. One reason I'm doing that, I'm not as smart as they are. Everybody knows that. But I'm telling you, Barclay is just the best commentator of the New Testament that you're ever going to find. And so I put your stuff in here, again, quitting your appetite that you might go online sometime and pick up a new set of Bar William Barclay's Daily Bible Study Series. Fantastic Bible too. Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law or the prophets. We're going to talk about what the law means in just a moment. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. We're going to talk about fulfilling, what that means. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest part will, will, will go away. So, will heaven ever disappear? No, heaven will never disappear. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying there is not a chance <laughs> that even the smallest part is going to be done away with. No, not until everything's been accomplished. So when everything's been accomplished, that is to say, when Jesus comes again, the second time, and establishes his rule and his kingdom, in the kingdom of God, in heaven, we won't need law. We won't need rules and regulations. Because what you're going to find there is love. And the rule of love rules in heaven. Has any one of you ever read any of the books about near-death experiences? Anybody? One, two, three. Wonderful. And you, have you ever talked to people who have experienced one of those near-death experiences and went through the tunnel? I know Mike has in the work he does. I'm sure he has. Uh, I've read several of those. I've talked to several people in my life as a pastor of these last number of years that have experienced that. There's some common things in all of those stories and, and in all those books. The people who have that quote-unquote near-death experience where they seemingly float out of their body and they're up at the ceiling level or up above their body. And some of them have talked about traversing the universe in that spiritual body and just thinking they want to be someplace and boom, they're there. Uh, it's amazing to read those books, but the one thing in common is every single person says when they went through the tunnel, and that's a common experience for all the experiences, they say that when we got through the tunnel, there was this light 
that they didn't know how to describe and this incredible peace and this incredible feeling of love. Love. So, when the kingdom of God is made manifest to me, we won't need any of this stuff. And Jesus says, not even the smallest part is going to go away. So, with all, all that said, let's just go ahead and plunge into the, the stuff we got here. And the first and most important thing I note in your study sheet is sheer astonishment. I mean, if, if any serious student of the Bible who begins reading the, the Sermon on the Mount and they get down to this part, now they've read the Bible, a serious Bible student, I'm saying, has read the Bible, has sat in Sunday school classes, has heard sermon after sermon, any serious Christian, any serious studier of the Bible has read the Gospels many times, probably. And when they come to Jesus standing up and saying, I didn't come to do away with the law, not even a tiny speck of it. And I don't need to tell you, do I need to? Well, you've had this Sunday school very quickly, very quickly. You know what an apostrophe is? You know what an apostrophe is? Don't. D-O-N apostrophe T. That apostrophe is the size of a mark in the law that Jesus is saying that will never go away. That's something that small. Or if you wrote the letter I in capital letters, where you cross the top of that I, that little dude part on the right hand side of the down, that little tiny thing, that's what Jesus is talking about. Nothing, not even a smidgen is going to be done away with. So any serious student of the Bible comes up and Jesus is saying, he didn't come to do away with all. None of it. Not even that smidge is going to be lost. First thing I thought about, my eyebrows raised up, and I thought, whoa, wait a minute. Because <laughs> I read the book. Jesus broke law after law after law. He and his disciples did not observe the hand washing ritual. You had Sunday school lessons where the disciples, they were going through the field of grain, and they were hungry, and it was the Sabbath, and they reached out and grabbed some corn or some wheat and rubbed in their hands, and they ate it. And, and, and the Pharisees accused them of reaping and harvesting, you know, because they had the law. And, and Jesus, you know, he, he just defended them, defended himself. And he always had an answer for them. But if you know the Bible, and you do, Jesus broke law after law after law. So he, for example, healed people on the Sabbath day, which was forbidden by the law. You could tend to a sick person on the Sabbath day, and I got that on the next page. We'll talk about it, but you, you could keep a person from dying if you wanted to, if you could, on the Sabbath day, and you could try to give them some comfort. If they had an earache, you could stick a wad of cotton in their ear, but you could not put any ointment on that cotton. That would be breaking the law. And so all this stuff was going on. So, so, so Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. You remember reading about it? He had Sunday school lessons on it. The woman with a hunchback, and he says, come here, come here. You know, straighten up. <laughs> the man with a withered hand, come here, come here. Let, let's shake hands. And this guy reached out his hand. I mean, you know, you have read all this. And you read how the scribes and the Pharisees just condemned him. The man who was born blind from birth. John's Gospel, chapter 9. Jesus healed him. And then John added it was on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees accused not only Jesus, but the man. You know, What are you doing letting somebody give you your sight back on the Sabbath day? I mean, can you imagine? So any serious student of the Bible comes up on Jesus saying, I didn't come to do away with the law. I come to fulfill it. Every mention of it. And, and then we need to understand then something about this business of the law. So scoop down on your sheet down there where I got the numbers starting. <clears throat> when we see that Jesus is laying down the eternal character of the law, he's emphasizing the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. The Jews in Jesus' day, when they spoke of, quote-unquote, the law, they were talking about one of these four things. First and foremost, they spoke of, quote, the law as the Ten Commandments. They spoke of the law to mean the first five books of the Bible, what we call the Torah, literally the first five scrolls, the rolls of the Bible. Thirdly, they spoke of the law as 
the law and the prophets by which they meant the entire Old Testament as they had it in Jesus' day. Remember, the Gospels had not been written yet. So the entire Bible, the law and the prophets, was the entire Old Testament as we know the Old Testament. And then fourthly, they spoke of, quote, unquote, the law to mean the oral or the scribal law. Now, this is the part we want to focus on tonight because in Jesus' time, it was this oral law or this scribal law which Jesus condemned and which Paul the Apostle condemned. So, what is this scribal law? <clears throat> in the Old Testament, there is not really a giant number of rules and regulations. Rather, in the Old Testament, we find great, broad principles which persons must, with God's guidance, interpret and apply those principles to their own individual lives and their own individual situations. For example, the Ten Commandments, you read the Ten Commandments in your Old Testament, you do not find rules and regulations at all. What you find is great principles out of which every one of us must find the rules and regulations for our life. For the Jews, the Jews thought the, the Ten Commandments were incomplete. And this is their reasoning. They believed that the Ten Commandments, the law, were divine. The whole Ten Commandments, all of them were divine that God has spoken, God has spoken his last word to human beings through the Ten Commandments given on Sinai to Moses. <clears throat> so they reasoned that if this was God's word to them, therefore every single aspect of life must be contained in those Ten Commandments. If something was not in the Ten Commandments explicitly, it was there implicitly. And they just had to study the Ten Commandments and figure out what God was trying to get them to do in every or any given situation of their lives where, where they lived every day. So they reasoned that out of the law, it was possible to understand a rule and regulation for every single possible situation that any human being would ever come up on in their lifetime. So, there arose this group of men that we call scribes who made it their business of life to expand the great principles of the Ten Commandments, the law, literally into tens of thousands of rules and regulations. For example, the law said that the Sabbath day is holy and no work is to be done on the Sabbath day. Then the scribes asked, what is work? How do you define work? Then they proceeded to define thousands and thousands of instances that could be defined as work. For example, you can't carry a burden on the Sabbath. Oop, wait a minute, time out. Let's define burden. What do you mean by burden? If I, if, if, if I break the law, if I, if I can't carry a burden, what is it that I can't carry? So you've got to define what a burden is. So now they're going to have thousands and thousands of definitions of what a burden is. Well, you can't pick up anything that weighs more than a dried fig. Oh, okay. Well, are we talking about a big fig or a great big old? Uh, what do you call it? A great big old? I can't remember the name of it now. It's going from, is it a big fig or a little fig? You know, because they would weigh differently. And they have such stuff. And I got all this thing in your carry thing here. Uh, a guy who's a tailor who, who mends clothes and makes clothes, if he accidentally leaves his house on the Sabbath, he's got a needle in his vest, is he carrying a burden? Does that weigh more than a dried fig? And so here we go with all these thousands and thousands of crazy, <coughs> stupid rules and regulations. And I mean, it was a bunch of them. They spent endless hours arguing whether a mother or a father could actually pick up their child on the Sabbath day. You remember us talking about you are the light of the world last time we met? And I talked about how that lamp with that floating wick was the light that Jesus was talking about. And I explained how when a Jewish family left their home, they would take that lamp and put this bushel, this, this clay pot over it, 
so it wouldn't accidentally burn down the house while they were gone. No mouse or no rodent, no creature would not accidentally knock it over and have that. Well, if it was a Sabbath day and it was going to leave the house, was it illegal to move the lamp from one place to another? All these crazy rules they made up. <clears throat> so, for instance, and I, I'm kind of going through this pretty quickly, but if you wrote, if, if, if you wrote, if you could write, and if you had a stylus, a pen, that you had made from one of the reeds on the, on the bank of the river or the lake, uh, and, and if you wrote more than two letters of the Hebrew alphabet with a certain ink, it was considered work. So you had to define the reed, you had to define the ink, you had to define, it, you know, it was your left-handed or right-handed. It made a difference. It made a difference if you were left-handed or right-handed. And so on and on and on. To heal on the Sabbath, we were just talking about, that was defined as work. And I talked about you can keep the patient where he's at, but you can't make him get better on the Sabbath. So, <laughs> the scribes were the men who wrote, who interpreted, who worked out all of these rules and regulations. Now, the Pharisees, and that word literally means the separated ones, these were men who separated themselves from all of the ordinary activities of living your life every day, and they devoted themselves to trying to keep every one of these laws that had been handed down orally to them. They believed that if every Jewish person in the land of Israel would keep all of the law for one 24-hour period, the Messiah would appear and save Israel from everything. So that was their belief. Now for generations, the scribal law was never written down. It was handed down through the generations of memories from all the ancestors. It was an oral law. Much like in this country, the Indians, the native peoples, handed down orally their traditions, their songs, their language. <clears throat> in the middle of the third century AD, there was a summary made of all of these oral laws. They were gathered up, they were written down, and this is known as the Mishnah. The Mishnah contains 63 subjects. It's a book containing 63 subjects that were dealt with by the Jewish scholars formerly and systematically. And when printed in English, it makes up almost 800 pages. The Mishnah, the summary of all the oral law. Later, later on, Jewish scholars said, well, we got the Mishnah, but how do we interpret all of that? So they began to write commentaries on the Mishnah. And so in Jerusalem, there is uh, these commentaries are called Talmuds. A commentary was known as a Talmud. And in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Talmud contained 12 printed volumes. 12 printed volumes. The interpreter's Bible that I have on my library shelf at home is 12 printed volumes. And it takes up about this much space for a damn book. <clears throat> the, there was also a Babylonian Talmud, and it contained 60 printed volumes. All of this to try to get you to understand the volume of the rules and regulations that over the years the scribes had written or handed down orally. All the things that you could or could not do. There was never any real end to it. So when we talk about that, the strict Jew, the Orthodox Jew of Jesus' day, in keeping these thousands of Teruz and regulations, this was a matter of life and death. They believed it was a matter of life and death, and they tried, they really did try to keep the law. So, <clears throat> no wonder they condemned Jesus. <laughs> he repeatedly broke the laws over and over again. He completely broke the laws. His disciples broke the law. So what did Jesus mean then when he spoke about the law 
and the fact that he didn't come to do away with it but to fulfill it. We believe that Jesus meant that he had come to give mankind, to give the world the real, true meaning of the law. Behind this scribal law and oral law was a great, great principle. That principle stated that in everything, in all things, a person must. Notice the emphatic use of the word must. A person must seek God's will for their life. Have any of you ever prayed the prayer that God might show you his will for your life? You have. Every one of you, haven't you? And in every matter of your life. God, I think I love this old boy and I really want to marry him, but God, is that your will? Is he the right one for me? God, I've been offered this new job and this new position and, and, and God, you know I'd love to tell you this is a good offer. But God, is this what you want for me? Is this your will for my life? God, we'd like to have one more child. But is that your will for us? On and on it goes. God, I want to buy this home for my family. Is that your will for my family? And some people, especially Southern Baptists, really get carried away with it, you know. Lord, I want to have lunch today. Where should I go? What is your will for me to go have lunch today? I think we can carry it too far and get somewhat like the scribes and Pharisees in that area. But seriously, every one of us want to know that we are living our lives within God's will for us. Don't we? The Jews believed this emphatically. Jesus believed that the Jews were right about this part of it, that they must, first of all, seek God's will for their life. And then once they understood or believed they understood what God's will was for their life, they must dedicate their entire life, everything they do from that point on, they must dedicate it to live that life that they think is God's will for them. <clears throat> Whenever I did quote-unquote surrender to preach the gospel, to become a preacher of the gospel for Jesus. The moment that I made that decision, I understood that the rest of my life would be totally different. That my entire life, everything I do, say, think, eat, breathe, everything had to be dedicated to that calling, that calling that God had placed upon me. And I would venture to say that every one of you, knowingly or unknowingly, have submitted to God's calling on your life. First of all, every one of you here tonight have submitted to God's calling on you to become <coughs> born again, to be a child of God, to join his family in the new birth, the salvation experience. So you answered that calling. <coughs> and aren't you glad that you did? Sweating those great drops of blood 
in agony, say, God, Father, is there not another way we can do this? But if not, the last reference, not my will, but your will be done. And every one of us, time and time and time again in our lives, have to say that same prayer, don't we? Nevertheless, not what I want, God, but what you want. Okay. Behind the scribal law, the oral law, there was one great principle. And, and I just stated that principle about knowing God's will. So then, if Jesus came to give the world the real, true meaning of the law, what is that meaning? Take a quick glance with me again at the Ten Commandments. Read your sheet that I gave you tonight. These are the essence and foundation of all law. The whole meaning can be summed up in one word, respect, or a better word, reverence. So look at how I listed that for you. I'm, not, I'm taking this straight out of uh, William Barclay's work. I'll look straight out of it anyway, a little bit of condition. One, reverence for God. Reverence for the name of God. There is only one God. I am the Lord your God. There is none other. And, and in, in that famous Jewish quotation, you know, you shall have no other gods before me. So reverence for God, reverence for the name of God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Reverence for God's day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know these commandments. Reverence for parents. Honor your father and your mother that your days on earth might be long. Reverence for life. You don't take another person's life. Reverence for property. You don't steal somebody else's ox or cow or four-wheeler or chainsaw. You have reverence for everybody's property. Reverence for personality. I think I had a misprint. Uh, reverence for personality. Reverence for the truth. Reverence for another person's good name. Reverence for oneself so that wrong desires may never master us. Do not covet your neighbor's wife. So these Ten Commandments are summed up in these two words, respect or reverence. And these are the great fundamental principles behind the Ten Commandments. This respect for God and respect for our fellow man and respect for ourselves. The older I get, the more news I see, <clears throat> I am appalled at man's inhumanity to man. The foreign countries especially, but even here in America, man's inhumanity to man. And it oftentimes done by people who go to church and who claim to be Christ followers, Christians. It ought not so to be. Love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus said. Who's my neighbor? There you go, you got to define everything. Who's my neighbor? So he tells us a story about a Samaria. I've got to bring you a teaching about Samaria. I'll give you all that background if you don't already know it, so you would know how hated and despised. Samaritans were by the Jews. When I tell that story in a parable form, I don't use a Samaritan. I either use a black person or a person from India. And I always agitate people by saying, you know what I'm talking about? You know them wet backs and them rag heads and <laughs> spinks and all those derogatory words that we have used to describe our fellow man when the commandment says do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain and because we are created in God's image, every one of us is in the image of God and when I call somebody a wet back or a spink or a raghead or a nigger when I use that term I am using the name of God in vain and it ought not so to be for the children of Almighty God I'm preaching. <laughs> Sorry, I got to preach instead of teaching. <laughs> there can be no such thing as law without these great principles. All law, if it is law, hangs on 
is defined by, is based on these principles found in the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. So it was this reverence and this respect that Jesus came to fulfill. He came to show all humanity what it meant to dedicate one's life to the will of God. And that's where I put in 170 times in the Gospels. Jesus said, I didn't come to my will, came to do the Father's will. <clears throat> By the life he lived, Jesus demonstrated what reverence for God and what respect for a fellow man looked like. And that reverence and that respect did not consist in obeying petty rules and regulations. Reverence and respect did not consist in making sacrifices, but in mercy. What did God say to the Old Testament prophet? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What did David say in Psalm 51? Oh God, I could kill you a bunch of cattle if you want, but that's not what you want. You want a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, this you won't despise. This is what we're talking about, what Jesus came to do. Not legalism, but love. Not the thou shalt not, but in teachings to live lives that demonstrate the positive command to love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. The reverence and respect, which are the basis of the Ten, of the Ten Commandments, the law, can never <coughs> pass away. This is what Jesus is talking about that will never, ever pass away. That reverence and that respect for those Ten Commandments that God handed to Moses on the tablets of stone on Mount Sinai, way back then. That will never pass away, the reverence and the respect for those great principles found there. So within these verses, Jesus also is laying out some very broad principles about the past and the present. He's telling us that there's a definite connection between the past and the present. How appropriate that we do this study and say these words this, the Wednesday night before our Sunday homecoming where we talk about our past and our present and our future. The past and the present never are either are, whether they are both and. Now, I'm going to bring a sermon Sunday morning using Paul's words uh, to the Philippian church where he said, I have not yet attained. Y'all remember that passage? Forgetting those things which are behind. I stretch forward to the mark of the high calling of God as our city. You're going to have to understand language here. And you're going to have to understand uh, para paradox. So when Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, you have to remember, you don't mean forget every single thing in the past. But I, mean, I intend to say Sunday morning, and here, and again, and again, and again, there's a bunch of things we need to forget. <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff we need to leave behind. And I will give you an analogy as this church moves forward. Think about those. I'm repeating myself. Remember, repetition, repetition, repetition. Think about those covered wagon days one more time. If you was over in Philadelphia and you was loading up your family and your belongings to go out to California, you got a covered wagon which wasn't very big at all. I mean, it was really small. And you chose which set of ruts you were going to get in because you couldn't change them once you got moving. But my point is, what would you put on that covered wagon? Mm -hmm. You had a limited amount of space, and you really had to prioritize, and you took what was the most valuable things with you. And as this church goes forward, we will leave some things behind, and we will take things forward that's really important to us using that analogy, if you would. So here, Jesus is not trying to do away with the past by saying, you know, he came to, he, he didn't come to do away with the law. He's, he's talking about the past of the law. But within these verses, he's laying out these broad principles of past and present. He's telling us that there's a definite connection between the past and the present. They are never, 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 ever just either the past or the present. No, they are both and the past and the present. And I would have quoted him from, from Winston Churchill. And I love this quote. If we open a quarrel between the past and the present, 
we shall find that we have lost the future. A lot of wisdom in there, is it not? There had to be a law before there could be a gospel. Men had to learn the difference between right and wrong. Men had to learn their own inability to live within the demands of the law. They had to learn what sin was. What missing the mark meant. What transgression meant. The difference between trying real hard but messing up and deliberately doing the wrong. Men had to learn these things. Mankind had to learn to identify sin. And so it is real common for us human beings to blame where we are today on our past, what happened in our past. And sometimes that's awfully true. We do suffer the consequences of those choices, don't we? Yes, we do. But at the same time, it's equally important, and maybe even more so, to acknowledge our debt to the past. Many of you here today, all of us here today, owe a debt to those who have gone before, those who paved the way. And if you want to go all the way back to those early pioneers or stop with those who just lost their life in Afghanistan, we owe a debt to those who made it possible for us to come here tonight without any fear of law or soldiers or harm done to us to freely, openly study a book we call the Bible and to pay our respects to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We owe a debt to those who make this possible for us, and we need to maintain this for those coming behind us. <clears throat> now, I'm going to quit. I'm over my time. I'm going to quit in verse 20. Jesus warns anybody that to be a Christ follower, a Christian, is not easy. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus was getting, was getting at was motive. The scribes and the Pharisees lived under the motive of law. Their entire life was devoted to satisfying the demands of the law. And in theory, if you think about it, in theory, if a person really put their mind to it, probably, they could keep all, they, they could live a 24 hour period without breaking those laws. I think they could. But even if they could, Barclay points out, that then that person could say, okay, I've done it. I fulfilled the law. I'm through with it. Therefore, I'm a free man. The law has no more hold on me. I did it. So there's an end, you see, to the law. But the, the motive that Jesus was talking about for keeping the law, for, as we understand it now from what we've talked about, the principles behind the law, what Jesus was talking about, his motive was love. The motive of the Christian is always love. We do everything, we should do everything in love. Love does, how do you ever repay God for what he's done for us in Jesus Christ? Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the sky of parchment made if every man on, if every if every stalk on earth were a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. We could never repay God for what he's done for us in Christ Jesus, ever. And so, <laughs> again, the, the, song, uh, the home writer, songwriter said, we're the whole realm of nature mine. That were present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my love, my all. Jesus aimed to satisfy the love of God. The Jews wanted to satisfy the law as they understood it. I want you to hear and rehear and practice and keep practicing love. And it is not easy. It is not easy. Pray with me, please. Oh, dear God, fill us with your Holy Spirit to the point that your love flows out of us, out of the pores of our skin, Lord, so that whoever we come in contact with will know without us putting on a bumper sticker or a lapel pin or anything, they will know that we are yours because we show love.